back to the Independent Investor Channel. I do a weekly update here on Hylion as of late. I, I believe that it's appropriate. I believe it is uh, absolutely prudent to acknowledge uh, where we currently are right now uh, as the stock price really has cast um, quite a dark shadow on um, where we are currently uh, in the uh, evolution of this company uh, and the prospects moving forward. I think potentially we, we could be setting up for reflection on this time as being either one of two things. Uh, either it was the uh, inflection point where uh, the company ceased to exist or, or went away, um, or, or it was the time that had created the, the, the best buying opportunity. Um, I, I try to shy away from, um, other than acknowledging that the stock price is in the shitter, um, I try to stay away from and shy away from um, whether or not I think it's a good buy point or, or not. I, I think people need to uh, look at the totality of the opportunity. And I think comparatively speaking, you know, you look at um, certain opportunities in the stock market where it's completely justifiable um, to buy a, a whole host of dividend stocks out there um, that will probably, in, in all honesty, underperform the market. Um, and that's somehow socially acceptable. Um, but when we look at an opportunity like this and we're trying to uncover value where there's not a lot of people out there um, trying to foot stomp the holistic opportunity that I see, um, I'm going to do up a list here. And this is typically what I do uh, on, on every company that I invest in. Um, those dividend companies that I spoke about, uh, I do my due diligence one time and then I don't, I don't do it. I, I become a passive investor in those positions, but highly on uh, demands of the investor to be uh, more active on it. Uh, and, and I think that's a lot of people's fallacy is that they would invest in a company like Ileon um, and expect to change their lives overnight um, or within a week or within a month or, or within two months. Uh, I, I do these uh, way more than I want to. I, I think once a week is, is way, way too much uh, to be talking about a company. Um, however, I do think it's prudent. Uh, and I do think a lot of people benefit because they are um, in the stock for the long term and they want to continually um, sow the landscape out there for developments on the company. Uh, so I think one week is prudent. I, there's a, a lot of really good channels out there that are covering highly on um, and, and, and my hat's off to them. I really enjoy it. Uh, I usually do a little bit longer highly on videos. Hopefully I can get through this uh, in a, a, a shorter amount of time. I do apologize for the longer videos, but I get to the end of a 10 or 15 minute video on highly on and I'm like, I, I could have used a little bit more, um, maybe in depth, uh, maybe, uh, you know, give that fact out there. Um, but then it never hurts to provide um, some level of, of opinion. Um, and, and this is this is YouTube, okay? Um, I'm not a stock analyst on Hylion. Um, I, I am a pundit <laughs> covering the stock and I am a bullish stock owner in the company. So as much as I want to come on and, and, and bash the stock price or bash the company for the cons that I'm going to outline for you today, um, it's very difficult for me to do that because according to my list, which I draw up, uh, which is as, as much uh, objectivity as I possibly can, um, the pros outweigh the cons just like they always have um, with this company. And I think a lot of people do benefit from uh, hearing my perspective on it as I benefit from hearing others' perspective. C case in point, Dexter with Drive Mix Game doing a great job released uh, the as of late the fueling video as well as the highly on technician uh, that came on and did some on-site servicing of a faulty wire um, in the uh, head unit in the cab, um, which uh, gave a, a fault display that could not be reset. Uh, so highly on had to actually uh, respond to that. But uh, from a driver perspective, uh, from somebody who is, from best of my knowledge, not a share owner in the company, uh, but but interested in the com company nonetheless, and 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 seeing the progress um, as a driver of one of the CNG trucks, it really helps to ground truth uh, a lot of information. And and so Dexter with Drive Mix Game gets a shout out. Um, second on the list is Paul Cardo. Uh, I've I've come to know Paul within the last year. Uh, I watched a lot of his videos uh, and did not comment. Um, and and I, I don't I do that a lot. 
Um, uh, I will not spend time on content that I do not find value in. Uh, and Paul is a, a, on a very short list with me uh, of, of, of channels that I enjoy when those new uploads come on. Uh, I enjoy his perspective. I enjoy his attempt at neutrality. Um, I really enjoy it when he jumps on one side or the other and gives a perspective just from one from one side because it's contrary and it's against the current on what is being offered uh, a lot of the times by um, some other channels that I don't typically shout out on the Independent Investor Channel um, just because I do have a larger reach and a larger audience. Um, and, and I think that... Um, um, you, you know, sometimes these topics on YouTube can be uh, an excuse to build a channel. And, uh, you know, my kudos go out and go out to those channels that I think are, if they do grow, I will be um, the, the first one to say, hey, congratulations. But I don't think that that's their primary motive. I actually sense the sincerity on that they really do enjoy this. And I do. I enjoy these, and and that has to be reciprocated from me from the channels out there um, that I see and I respect covering uh, the the companies. Um, RP Music is another one. Uh, PJ Ski is another one. Gives a, a very very nice, um, uh, really from a perspective of somebody who's not domiciled here in the U.S. Uh, and I like that. It, it gives us a much more holistic approach and a much more holistic uh, perspective on how. Um, somebody who does not live in this country um, uh, sees the progress or the lack of progress from his perspective going on. So shout out to those channels. I really appreciate the community and for what small part we uh, provide here in supplementing the dialogue in a period that I think for whatever reason, and I'll talk about it in the cons, um, Hylion has entered into, now they are in quiet period now, uh, here just coming on 23 days before earnings call. Um, I, I, unlike a lot of people, don't have high hopes for this. Um, this is the last quarter to close out 2021. Uh, and although projections were made that, that, that somehow there was going to be some magic or earnings number in the back, back, back of my mind, I actually think they're going to come out with their fifth beat and they're going to surprise to the upside. I actually believe that's going to happen. Um, am I expecting that? No, I'm not. Uh, this company has driven my sentiment down so far um, that even the company up 6% on Friday, um, I have every expectation, and I've been proven this right over and over and over again, is that we'll give it all back on Monday anyway. So my sentiment as far as the stock goes is as about as low as it can possibly be. When that happens, there is usually a light at the end of the tunnel. And so when you want to know my perspective and you don't want me to beat around the bush, the, 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 the lower my perspective may go on where I think sentiment is with the stock as it relates to the company probably does not reflect what I'm doing behind the scenes. And that is slowly and methodically picking my spots to accumulate shares at, at, at these prices. Um, my, my pros and cons list that I do up on my fundamental evaluation, um, I had a comment come through the channel that said, you know, if you use the same metrics to look at Tesla as you do Hylion, um, then I would second guess your uh, evaluation of Hylion. Um, I, I think that speaks to the stupidity of the morons who come on to YouTube and, and, and try to sit back from a position of convenience and, and, and try to justify why it is I do what I do and share it with an open audience. You can either invest or not invest. But if you expect me to compare what I look at with the opportunity with highly on holdings and what I look at as an overvalued cult with Tesla, no problem. You, we can disagree. We can agree to disagree on that. No problem. Um, me and you look at the world in completely different lights in that I think that the majority of people are looking at Honda Accords and Toyota Camrys as opposed to Tesla, which I actually think is an ugly car and I have no motivation to get it. I'm not the only one. Some people want to call Tesla a technology company. Others want to call it a car company. I look at it like a discretionary company. In other words, people ebb and flow with regard to their preferences with handbags, with clothing, with the, the, the groceries that they buy. And people, consumers, are fickle. And if you think Tesla is going to stand the test of time with providing three models, 
to the masses and you think that that overpriced uh, offering to what is tailored toward a luxury community is going to somehow break into the masses and people like myself who enjoy my Toyota Tacoma, uh, I can pop it into four wheel drive and, and, and you know, execute my, my drive here on icy roads when we get snow here in Virginia for the first time in 20 years. It's a discretionary element. In other words, I look at the use case for my vehicle, not just being called upon with a, a cult following that buy a Tesla just to buy a Tesla, because why? Because it's fast. Um, I, I pass Teslas all the time on the freeway and they're not out there juicing it around to show off how the direct power um, can accelerate faster than any car out there. They're not doing that, okay? So I, I, I dispute the model that somehow, you know, because the stock price is down right now, that I'm wrong in my evaluation or my investment thesis on the company. It is what it is. You can disagree or, or, or agree, but you need to understand the totality of what the position means for me and how it fits into my total overall portfolio. It's 9% of my portfolio right now, 9%. It breaks my rule of having two, no more than two to 3% of any one given holding in a particular company. But with the stock market at an all time high, and even after the, the recent sell-off of 10%, the market is still relatively high. So my conviction on the S&P 500 at 25 times earnings, I need to see that roll off before my conviction really starts to get bullish. And I'm talking below 20, okay? Historical mean average is around 15 or 16, um, but at 25, the market's, market's expensive. So what do we do? Um, do we go to value? Well, I don't want my entire portfolio wrapped up in value either. Um, because I don't want to underperform the market year over year. Okay, the dividends are nice, yes, but this is just indicative of in the short term me seeing opportunity uh, in a company that uh, came to market, uh, enjoyed a lot of euphoria, and now it's enjoying a dose of reality. And the truth probably resides somewhere in the middle, <laughs> you know, in that is the company going to zero because they're choosing to take this kind of quiet period. Uh, in, in what they're doing behind closed doors, uh, perhaps anything is possible in stock market investing. Um, I, I would not have the bullish thesis and I would not invest in this company if I thought that the possibility of it shutting its doors next week uh, was a possibility with all of the potential that it has going forward. So let's get right into it, guys. We're going to talk about the, the, the cons. I'm going to talk, give it the negatives right away um, so you can stay with me. Uh, throughout the totality of, the, of this video, you're not going to want to miss, miss this. Um, if you invest in the company now and the company goes up in the future, there's money to be made. Uh, if you invest in the company now and, and the, the company goes belly up, you're going to lose money. But it, it, one of those two things are going to happen, okay? Uh, you know, if it's a neutral application, you could say that the stock is going to remain neutral um, over the course of this year, next year. There's some schools of thought they can't bring product to market soon enough. The stock is going to stagnate. Um, I beg to differ. I think there's a lot of catalysts out there that could happen, transpire over the next couple of years in the evolution of this young company that could absolutely shift the sentiment. And it can shift overnight. Um, and it can shift during non-market periods to where the stock can get to gap up. And you have to be in the stock to own those gap ups at the time. I've seen this many, many times. And that's what will start the FOMO buying in this company to be like, whoa, hold on a second. The pros that Ryan has been foot stomping for months over months, um, as well as some of the negatives, yes, but the pros that he's outlined, um, why, why didn't we see that? Why were we so blinded and caught up in um, the, 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 the Yahoo threads out there, um, some of the short selling efforts that have been done to drive this company down and not see through the smoke? and understand that this company um, on its surface, on its surface has a lot to offer uh, to, to the um, uh, long haul trucking space. The cons, number one, no sales, okay? We expected in 2021 to close out with 8 million in revenue. Are they gonna make that? Absolutely not. When I say in the deep depths of my mind that they're gonna throw out a number of sales, uh, I would be surprised if they're seven figure sales. Um, and, and the bottom line, actual profit that's made from that, um, they're not going to turn a profit this quarter. That's just that simple. Um, if they can turn one or $2 million of revenue, uh, that would be absolutely extremely bullish for the company. 
Now, whether or not those 359,000 on the accounts receivable um, fall to the bottom line really just shows that they've got about 600 or so to realize in sales. I, I haven't seen indication outside of the sporadic EX sales numbers to some of these fleets and they're being extremely, extremely quiet about these numbers. Um, and, and that's where I think that where you see not a lot of churn and activity in this space, um, don't expect that they're just gonna come and blow out the numbers. If they do, I'm gonna be disappointed because I think dragging investors through the mud when there's good stuff going on behind the scenes and for whatever reason they've thought not to share that with the marketplace, would be extremely unprofessional in my opinion. That's why I don't think that they're doing that. And I don't think that that uh, lends itself to the February 2022 call uh, here coming up. I don't think that, that it, we're setting up for any type of a blowout number. A blowout number for me would be 4 million on the top end, which is half of the 2021 projections that they made in 2020. I don't think there's any way we get close to that. As a matter of fact, I don't think we're going to break the seven figure mark. I don't believe that we're going to have a million of revenue. I, I just don't. Um, I, I just have not seen enough uh, indication, validation, uh, perhaps maybe the sentiment within Hylion to say, look, we're, we're selling units. We just need to stay the course. I hope that's the, the truth. Um, I hope that they have the pedigree there to surprise to the upside. But as of right now, there are no notable sales. There are sales going on of the EX hybrid. Um, the ERX is not ready for uh, sell yet. They still are in the validation stage and they can stay there as long as they need. I want them to get this right. Uh, it's just that simple. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bull on the company if they can turn out the ERX to uh, perform in the uh, marketplace the way that it is uh, projected to perform up to the specs. Uh, that they've put out there to the marketplace. So um, no sales as of yet to boast, um, but we are getting these small trickle-ins of, of sales and the cumulative realization uh, of these EX sales that have kind of uh, made their way on the books uh, over the last multiple quarters. Because remember, they have kind of deferred to this quarter uh, to kind of go ahead and realize those revenues. Um, if we can get a boost out of the stock, that would be nice really get it out of the basement and then allow us over the next couple of quarters to um, evolve with uh, continued EX sales, yes, um, and then the evolution of the Hypertruck ERX, but no sales uh, is the real key there. And number two for the con is the supply chain. Um, you can dispute me all you want on this. Um, there's companies out there that are suffering. Um, there's some that seemingly are, are not uh, acknowledging the supply chain issues. Some have just of late uh, acknowledge the supply chain issues. Um, you know, whether or not Hylion is kind of playing this up to buy themselves more time, I, I don't know. W what they said was that it, it is affecting them uh, in their ability to get certain key and critical components uh, for the systems that they are selling now, the hybrid EX specifically, uh, and maybe even affecting their ability to secure those uh, build slots for 2023 and 2024, which they've projected that those have been secured on the Q3 earnings call. So, you know, I look at this as being, of course, a negative. I, you know, this is th this company, if it does end up making it, um, has gone through a horrible, horrible time. And, and I think even the euphoria, it doesn't get any better than euphoria as far as the stock price uh, actually hurt the company. Um, I think it should have never been at $58. I think it hurt it. I think if it could have slowly grinded forward and they could have trickle fed um, this opportunity and not just come and rode that wave of momentum, if they would have taken this more conservative approach now, uh, then that they're taking now, then when it, when the company first IPO'd, I think we would have been in such a better position. But um, um, it's water under the bridge at this point. Uh, and I think there was some reason for that uh, original excitement uh, around the company. It's just that a recessed stock price at $4 a share is not going to generate the hype uh, that a company that is brand new out of the gate with no revenues generates at $50 plus. Okay, um, we'll get back there. It's just going to take time and it's going to take um, the very shakeout of the supply chain to promote those sales to start to uh, map uh, scale up a little bit. Uh, number three is the lack of residual income that I think Hylion is going to suffer from. Let me explain. 
where I put in the pro category their technology and their ability to use uh, their cloud computing and their algorithmic data to store the data for the trucking companies, the fleets that I'm sure the logistics are tracking this stuff, but what a great component there for the Hylion system to be installed um, and, and provide some of that potential residual income. They are not realizing that now. Uh, and I think it's, 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 it's a con for me in that if they're only realizing $5,000 on an EX unit they're installing on a, on, a, on a truck, that they're having to drive X number of hours to go and service. I'm referring to Dexter's video on the last technician service call that they had to make after only being installed for one month is somewhat troubling to me in that $5,000 of profit on a $40,000 install unit is that really that good? Are the margins really that great on the EXs enough to where, look, they're going to have to sell tens of thousands of these units to even make it a, 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 a profitable product. And what goes into these products, it's not like the margins on coffee. Coffee is very, very easy to make. It's very, very cheap to make. And the margins are outstanding. But when we're talking about a highly technical product like this, that takes a lot of hands on deck to make this happen only to put it into the hands of the service company and realize no residual value back on that product. In other words, you have to call the technician. I mean, I, I would like to see that the technician was already notified back at Hylion Holdings and that there was kind of a ro road mechanic type of an application here to where they knew that it was a fault in the system that would require their on-scene attendance. That's not what happened. They had to actually call um, and to solicit that work. Now, Hylion did a great job of responding to it, but good grief. I mean, when we start to exponentially increase the number of these EX units out there, um, can we expect that Hylion has enough to provide this type of tech support in the field? Um, th that's somewhat troublesome to me. And it's, it's troublesome to me from the perspective of, are they, are they garnering enough interest in the marketplace to put a product out there to meet the margins enough in, in, in respect to them not having residual income over that product. In other words, when that product is installed with the fleets, the TCO starts to benefit the, fl the fleet, not Hylion, okay? Because that product has been sold. There's no residual uh, benefit to putting that product out there. Now, Hylion has boasted that they want to take a proactive approach to walking side by side with their customers. I like that, but are they profiting from it? I mean, this, this is a business here, guys. So, you know, my question and, 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 and really scrutiny is on the, the margins on the EX product and the lack of what I see for prospective residual I income outside of their uh, potential for establishing uh, a customer-based subscription model for each of their fleets that monitor these systems um, on the EX and the ERX side, okay? The next con that I have, it's a negative of the company, I feel, I feel, is that they're being too quiet right now. Um, I pick up little tidbits on the videos that I, I, I see and the consensus across the YouTube community of creators that talk about this topic. I hear a little bit of insight from Dexter as well in his conversation with the technicians who are sitting in the EX during the, um, the, the ride along, um, the test phase of making sure that they uh, troubleshot and fixed the system, which they did. Um, how quiet they're being and why some of those reasons are um, in, in, in what they're doing in finalizing the Hypertruck ERX, trying to get this as, uh, as good as they can before it enters into the marketplace. Uh, some, su some surprises um, that Dexter could not release. He had to mute that part out of his video, um, but I was interested as to what that was pertaining to. Perhaps maybe the specifics of that conversation um, we weren't privy to, but we could maybe infer that there are some exciting things going on uh, behind the scenes of the company and perhaps maybe to protect the goings on of what is happening behind the scenes um, is driving some of this quiet period right now. In other words, is this the ample time for the company in their strategic direction to be really, really putting that information out there on the landscape? The ERX is not ready for mass scale up. They, they need to do a few more validations, winter test and validation, as well as um, EPA certification uh, of the unit 
and, and I'm sure that they're working hard on finalizing that unit, is now the time where they need to be pressing and pressing and pressing. And for you guys that follow me on Twitter, you know that I'm very scathing of highly on holdings, okay? It doesn't mean that I'm wrong, and it doesn't mean that I don't have the big picture, okay? The big picture is not codified for me in a tweet, okay? So for you guys that um, want to say one thing or another about me on Twitter, no problem. I could flush Twitter down the toilet tomorrow and probably be a happier man for it, okay? Um, if you do call me out specifically, uh, you're going to get my response, and I, I will continue to just draw down on those. So make sure that you're owning the words that you're putting out. If you're going to scrutinize or, or call me out uh, on, on social media, because I will respond, uh, especially to comments that imply that somehow I don't have the big picture or I'm wrong. Okay. Um, I'll scrutinize highly on and be wrong with, the, with regard to what I consider to be a con of the company right now, because they are so early in their inception. I don't believe that being quiet right now is in their best interest. That's just my opinion. It doesn't mean I'm wrong. It just means it's my opinion. And you've got channel creators like Dexter, myself, Paul, PJ, and those guys that are putting out information on the company that are trying to continually stoke that fire of excitement on the company to bridge them to where we think ultimately this company is going to go into the future. But a con for me is that I think they're being too quiet. Um, I think that there's things that they could strategically do. I think that they are choosing not to. Uh, and I think that's a mistake at this point. I do. Um, fleet acceptance uh, is a real negative for me. Um, I've got on the low end about 5,000 units as a minimum to be sold year over year um, when they do enter into mass scale up. Um, I don't see enough fleet acceptance or uh, fleet interest at this point. I don't. Um, I think Werner moving in a different direction to entertain the 15 liter Cummins engine uh, CNG is, um, I don't think that's good news for Hylion. I think some would argue that it's good for the direction of the industry as a whole in accepting uh, a, a potentially more of a viable CNG option. Uh, and, and with 10% of the fleet now utilizing CNG and hopefully expanding upon that number could be uh, indirectly beneficial to Hylion Holdings. Um, I think overall it's a net negative. Uh, th this is a company that is on the Innovation Council, and there are there are only eleven highly on included in the Innovation Council, um, and I think that's a negative um, to have a, a company that was supposed to be right there with highly on, and um, really providing some validation for fleet acceptance. And so for them to move into a different direction, I think is a negative. And I think I don't exclusively put this on Werner. I mean, we just went to Wegmans. We heard nothing. We heard nothing. Um, why couldn't there have been something to say, look, Hylian's knocking that out of the park. The interview seemed to suggest that they were very, very satisfied with uh, the product and the test drive that they had. Since then, we've heard crickets, nothing. I think this is a negative. I do. I think it does not show the ample level of interest to garner the units of sale that are going to be necessary uh, to maintain highly on to profitability. And, and we're talking 5,000 units on the low end, 15,000 units on the high end, as far as my estimations. According to Hylion's estimations, in 2024, we were looking at 15,000 each per unit, 30,000 total of the EX units in the Hypertruck ERX. 2024 is not going to garner 30,000 units unless this company can work magic or there is a catalyst that is so big and unforeseen on the landscape that investors are going to have a jaw-dropping type of moment when it happens. Amazon, Walmart, Walmart government contracts, um, a European company maybe that steps in and really steps in side by side with Hylion and really guarantees a solidified guaranteed binding order of 1,000 to 2,500 to 5,000 units uh, you know, over the coming years uh, that can really help to solidify that Hylion is here to stay and that that integration over time is going to absolutely be realized. But fleet acceptance is, 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 is negative right now. It's not there. It is not there. And people are going to argue with me up and down about it being too early. It's ill-timed. Bullshit. I, I beg to differ on all that. If Hylion was being as forward-leaning as they possibly could, 
uh, in, in garnering interest in their product. And they can sell the product the way that I can sell the product uh, to you guys, not sell the stock, sell the company and sell the product. It, it seems as if, and I, I make this statement for me and me alone, okay? Because I will not speak to, ab about the conviction of Paul Cardo with Rat Pack Stocks. I will not speak to the conviction of Dexter or PJ, but my conviction, it, it, I almost feel that I'm more bullish on the company than highly on holdings. And that's a problem. That is a problem. When I look at the information that is uh, publicly uh, available and I look at you know, what I scrutinize, um, I'm excited. And if I'm misinterpreting the information that's publicly available, or Hylion is misrepresenting what it is that they can do, um, then, then we've got this thing completely wrong. But it almost gives me a sense that Hylion is not as aggressive as they need to be to, to continually foot stomp that fleet acceptance. And, and I'm not talking about non-binding orders. That is the very fabric that is holding this thing together. And I don't think every day that goes by, those non-binding orders hold less water uh, for the investor class. Um, the stock market has called bullshit already. It has called the bluff of Hylion 100%. They are calling the bluff in that agility with a, bind, uh, with a non-binding order of a thousand. The stock market is saying that they will realize zero of those orders, zero. It's calling bluff. And I post this to Thomas Seeley through uh, Twitter. I'm the only one that does it. I have a few people that heart, heart my tweets and I get two or three likes or maybe at the most 25, but seemingly the masses disagree with me or don't care or are not interested in this topic. So why should I care so much about a Twitter audience when nobody seems to care as much as me anyway? Why do you do these videos? It's like Alcoholics Anonymous every week, Ryan. I do this because I want to. It's that simple. I do it because I want to. I do it for me. I do it to convey my conviction on the company. Uh, I, I do it out of frustration in that I think in 20 years, it, it, we are going to stymie technology in this company, in this country. We will stymie it. Where other countries promote it, uh, this country does everything that we can possibly do. Look at Tesla. Would it be profitable without the government incentives? Okay. The United States built the Gigafactory in China. So fantastic that we have chosen our winners and allowed for technological advancements in companies like Hylion and Nikola alike, Hyzon as well, to really be subject to uh, the, the rigors of the market because we've seemingly already picked our winners. And therefore we can't advance the technological discussion in other areas of advancement. In other words, we have to build infrastructure for the charging facilities across this nation. And, and there's people like me who disagree that that's the way. Um, it is part of the way, certainly. But what are the regulated utilities saying about this huge infrastructure build in this country with regard to the permits that are going to be issued and have to be run through the regulated utilities uh, before those said projects um, e e even break ground? No, nobody questions that. Nobody knows about it. Uh, we will all want to be naive about it and envision a, a, a future in 20 years where every single patron in this country drives a Tesla, I won't play ball. I'm sorry about that, I won't play ball. Fleet acceptance, it is absolutely a negative right now. And if they can't figure out how to garner interest within the marketplace, this company will falter. It will falter. They're not gonna be able to turn out you know, 40 orders a year and expect to keep the lights on at hold, highly on holdings. Just go private. If you're interested in an arts and crafts uh, science project, then just go private. Um, and, and we'll just chalk this up as the biggest debacle in the history of the stock market in dubbing or duping so many investors out there to thinking that by nature of their projections, they could move to mass scale uh, 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 production uh, in a timely fashion. 2024 is what they said. Um, that's not going to happen. So when is it going to happen? It, do I put this in the positive category? Hell no. This is a negative. OK, and until they can start to churn and surprise to the upside on catalysts to make the stock market understand that there is going to be to some capacity to some. I mean, we, we anticipated we all invested in this company based on two percent market penetration, not 100, not 50, not 25 and not 10 two two percent market penetration. And the stock market is saying that they will reach zero 
zero. Come on, Hylion. You, you got to find some level of, 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 of approach that is going to garner some level of interest. Pick up the damn phone and start making calls to people. It's, it, it's the way, the truth and the light with regard to garnering interest. And I would go so far as to say that there's a lot of people who don't even, a lot of fleets out there that don't even know that this company exists. Okay. Harsh statement, but I'm going to make it because fleet acceptance is not where it needs to be at this particular juncture. I believe it will grow, but right now it is an absolute negative. And unless they can get this barrier taken care of, um, the company will go nowhere. Okay. Um, next for uh, the negative category, and I, I do in these cons first so people can like, I don't know, get mad at me to start and be like, are you even invested in this company? I think that's irrelevant. Okay. So stop asking me. Okay. Stop worrying so much about what I'm doing with my position and just listen for a little bit. If you get tired of the long message, shut it off, take a break and come back. I'm fine. I will deliver it in a 60 minute shot all for you guys all at once. Okay. But reliability is key. Does the Hylion product do what it is that it's, it, it, it can do? Case in point, I just talked about the EX being turned out in a Fraxans application uh, in West Texas and having to respond to it because the system, uh, let's call it a catastrophic failure in that there was no reboot of the system. It was a, a, a wire or a plug. I, I, I'm not sure exactly what the problem was because they wouldn't allow the technicians, so the technicians wouldn't allow the, the, the troubleshooting and the actual fix of the unit, whether or not those learnings can be taken back and incorporated into um, what's supposed to be a finalized product. Oh boy, um, I took this a little different. And of course I dropped it in the Facebook group and I had one response so far that was like, no, Ryan, you're wrong. It happens all the time. And I was like, okay, well, maybe I'm the asshole. Maybe, yeah, this is going to be commonplace. Um, but when I buy an electrical product, it would be like as if I bought my Apple computer uh, and I had a catastrophic failure in that Apple computer one month after I bought it and had to call tech support uh, to provide me the troubleshooting service to bring my product up to speed that I just bought. Now, an iMac will cost you about 1500 to 2000 um, this unit was about 40 grand. So it, is it the customer's expectation that after a month, they're going to need to be doing this? Um, and how consistent of, it, of this is it going to be? It speaks to the reliability. And I put this in the negative category because I tell you what, we sure are extending this uh, project along for further and further validation. It's as if we're in infinite validation mode on this uh, project, uh, only to turn out uh, products that aren't 100% verified. And you guys can say I'm taking this too far. Uh, and I, I believe that I, I am. But is it not fair to, to, to scrutinize why it is that a product that has been put in place after a month um, needed technical support after a month? I, I, I'm not being an asshole. I'm just being critically uh, uh, um, critical of, of what's going on. And if, if we're looking to turn this product out globally, how is it that we can even expect to send technicians up to New York every other week to fix this EX product that I, again, want to footstop was supposed to be a final product ready for install and ready for run? It just, it doesn't sit with me. Reliability, could it shift over into the positive category? Absolutely. But for right now, that's a negative. With the amount of units out there in the field, um, ranging probably in the hundreds. I don't even believe we're breaking a thousand on units in the field. And to have back the ratio of those units that are not standing the rigors of in the field application, yeah, reliability goes in the con category at this particular point. Um, service uh, goes in the negative category. If they've got 150 employees or 200 employees, there's no way that they could have the service network available um, to respond in the capacity that they did uh, for Dexter's truck and drive mix game. Um, that's a negative, okay? Are they gonna be able to use existing fleet networks? I believe that they are. Uh, and that's a big, big negative when I talk about uh, situations like Nicola, where basically they are the OEM uh, and uh, being able to only service their own truck. In other words, Volvo is not going to service a Nikola truck for 
um, uh, um, reasons of liability. The same argument has been made through the channel for Hylion. Uh, I beg to differ because the Peterbilt network will be available uh, as them being the OEM that is uh, uh, integrated with Hylion. Uh, and so those service networks should be available to those uh, trucks, especially when the ERX is rolled off the line. Now, the EX hybrid is kind of owned by Hylion as a hodgepodge of, you know, uh, of, of equipment that's put together to uh, realize um, the function of that specific application. But Hylion owns the servicing, best I can tell, uh, and indicated by Drive Mix Games uh, video that he turned out um, just this week. Uh, so, you know, is service a negative at this point? Yeah, it is. I mean, we're not up to mass scale production and Hylion is going to have to figure out how to uh, properly address in a timely manner these injects because downtime in an industry that they are boasting to help uh, improve upon or eliminate potential downtime created by charging is only going to be exacerbated if they're putting a product out there uh, that, that cannot be reliable in its uh, application. Now, this is on Hylion's website on their very front page, um, reliability without sacrificing efficiency, something like that. Uh, right now, I put it in the negative category because until we've got 10 years under our belt with this Hylion product, and we've had the chance to troubleshoot, iron out, and put the test against this company uh, to be able to provide uh, ample service uh, in, as it relates to the reliability of the product, um, then it is yet to be seen. Uh, just another con that can shift over into the positive category uh, over due time. But right now, I think it's a vulnerability. The last thing I'll say as far as a con, uh, for me personally, I think if you were bullish on the company, uh, the company is more of a buy at $4 than it was at 20. That's simple. You cannot go back and redo the past. Uh, would I have wanted to walk this road with Hylion again? No, I will say the same thing when it reaches $100 a share or when it reaches $25 a share, it doesn't matter. You only have to walk the road once and you don't get to go back and walk it again. Uh, would I want to walk it again? No. But the progress that's been made up to the filming of this video is marked progress. But a negative surrounding the company right now, as it reflects to the stock price, uh, is absolutely a con. It's absolutely um, driving negative sentiment in the stock like I have never seen before. I cover the stocks um, in the markets and uh, good companies with good management and, and good ideas and good addressable markets um, and good balance sheets. They have no debt. They have good cash to make this product and, and, and really getting close to the finalized stages. Um, I think they're a couple stages away from a finalized product and then to work on the mass scale ramp up with the connections that they have. Um, I think Hylion deserves a little bit more of a nod that it's getting. doesn't matter what I think. doesn't matter. It only matters what the stock market thinks. And right now, like I've suggested, uh, the stock market is calling Hylion's bluff. It's just that simple. Um, was Hylion bluffing with the original projections on the original uh, presentation? Uh, I, I believe that they were extremely misleading uh, and uh, they're not gonna make those numbers. Uh, are we expected to forget those projections? Uh, absolutely not. I will not, I will not do that. Um, that, that information was put forward uh, with the best estimations that they had at the time, uh, with the best information that they have, uh, or was it, or was it just a, an educated guess at the time? Was it just a figment of somebody's imagination as to what they need in the marketplace, not what, what they could realistically garner from the marketplace? Uh, I'll leave that rhetorically up to you guys, okay? I've got my own uh, sentiment around how I feel about that specific declaration at the time to would-be investors. I honestly kind of partially feel duped, to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, we could be proven wrong. We could be rolling up to mass scale like we've never, uh, never could have imagined. Uh, and we could realize that 2% of addressable market, maybe more. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, right now, the goings on uh, speak to the, to the company actually being priced right now uh, at liquidation value. And it is $4. It's at liquidation value, 680 market cap. Um, we've been cut in half, uh, you know, over the last couple months. Uh, I remember when we were at 1.28 billion right now, we're at 600 million anemic. 
uh, embarrassing. And uh, Hylion's got a lot of work to do to make up this. So that's on the con side, okay? Wanted to give you the negative to start. Put that out there uh, up front. Um, I do it in a way that is uh, somewhat diplomatic. I don't, I'm not looking to drive Hylion into the ground. Um, I, I am uh, neutral in um, uh, supporting what it is their initiative is, is aimed at, at, at providing to the marketplace. And, and, and it speaks to my bullish conviction. And we're going to get into that now. All right. So the pros of the company, and when it, we look at the pros and cons of a specific investment, you need to look at the pros. I look at the business model being as lean as it is. Um, this company is not turning out new trucks. This company is a powertrain company. It's not an engine manufacturer. It is not an OEM. It, it, it does electrified powertrains. And the, the multiple use case for that is extremely interesting. Um, the facility that they run is fairly low cost. I believe that they could probably get by with just over $100 million of overhead per year. That's my best estimate if they run a pretty lean program. Um, they could pull back on r and I think that would be detrimental to the business. They invested $17 million, I believe, just last quarter in R&D. So they've ramped that up ex extensively. And that is always a good thing for a technological industrial company like Hylion Holdings. Um, and it should be something that bullish shareholders uh, get behind um, when we're looking to understand whether or not they're pulling back uh, to protect CapEx uh, or they're ramping up on because they truly do believe uh, that they have an identified need in the marketplace to get this sucker to marketplace sooner than later. They ramp up that R&D. But the, the, the low cost, Sherry Baker has alluded to this on the last few quarters uh, on the earnings reports, uh, and it, it's been interesting to hear they have pulled back a little bit. I think that was in response to the supply chain issues and knowing that their timelines were going to be pushed back. I thought it was a prudent move, uh, but it doesn't cost a whole lot for Hylion to operate. Um, it is a, um, a, a lean business model, uh, and that's, that's a pro for me. Uh, in other words, do I take that book of business and their burn rate into consideration when I'm saying, are they going to be all tapped out in 12 months? No, they're, they're not. I mean, they could run this business for a long time. Best I see it, two and a half years, three years, which is what they said on the onset when they have enough capital to fully fund their business plan going forward. It's that simple. Whether or not anything comes of it is yet to be seen. But, but the cash on the books and their uh, uh, available uh, capital that they have, access to available capital uh, is very real, coupled with the low cost to run their business is absolutely a bullish thesis as far as I'm concerned. Uh, another pro uh, when we're talking about Hylion is, is the payload. And this is something that doesn't get talked about very often. Why would Detmar take an existing uh, Cummins CNG engine and add more horsepower to it. Why would they do that? More, more horsepower means more towing capacity, which means more payload potential capacity, which means higher loads, which means higher profits, which means a quicker payback on the, on the unit as a whole. So the hybrid not only pays for itself, but it also pays for the unit itself. Remember the Cascadia that Dexter drives with Drive Mix Game, is a CNG truck standalone, okay? That unit probably was $100,000, $200,000, okay? On a rough, rough estimate. When you add that CNG unit to it with an additional forty dollars or $50,000 investment in the unit, and you're able to realize more towing capacity, it, it, it speaks to everything we're talking about with regard to the bullish conviction. For these companies, it's all about the bottom line. So when you can put a product in place that allows for higher payload capacity, higher efficiency, um, uh, uh, less strain on the CNG engine, which are typically under horsepowered anyway, we'll get to the new 15 liter Cummins engine in just a second when I talk about this, but more payload means more money for the companies. That is about as bullish as a thesis as I can throw up throughout there. Comparatively speaking, uh, when I look at Tesla and I should just be a blind bull on Tesla, Tesla actually uh, has less payload. So you, you wanna try to make that sell for me, go ahead. Hylion can boast more payload, case in point, by how Detmar specifically is applying it in their fleets. 
This is a model that can be duplicated and scaled to other applications as well. I caught wind of this when they were talking to Wegmans uh, up in New York, talking about the tandem trailer application. This is where the Hypertruck ERX comes into play. If you can tow more and you can do it with negative carbon emissions and you can do it and make more money for the company on the bottom line, be better for the driver, better for the uh, company itself, it's a triple win across the board. But if you're looking to sell a company to say, look, you've got to go all electric because there's a cult following behind it. But hey, you're not going to be able to tow as much. And oh, by the way, your driver's going to be sitting on the side of the road uh, incurring downtime to charge that unit uh, in a, a piece of infrastructure. Oh, yeah, that doesn't exist as of yet. Um, but, but it's the right way to go. This is what I'm trying to draw a distinction between is that Hylion, with regard to its payload, doesn't get talked about very often. If they can tow more, they make more. I'll say it again. If they can tow more, they can make more. It's just that simple. If you take the Cummins new engine, the 15 liter CNG engine, and you put it into application, alpha, and you take scenario B, and you take that same 15 liter Cummins engine, and I don't care if it can... Uh, it can perform the same as the hybrid EX unit coupled to an old CNG engine. And now that older unit is brought up to the same efficiency as the 15 liter. Take that 15 liter CNG engine and double down on it and couple it with the, hy uh, the hybrid product and add that existing 120 horsepower. The, the, the rationale behind that is still the same. More payload means more profit to the bottom line for the companies. And when you're talking about more profit to the bottom line, you're talking about attributing a payback over X number of days, months, or years into the future to actually pay off the unit itself, and then also look to pay off and, and quickly pay back the investment that was made in the truck itself, okay? Huge, huge, it gets missed all the time, doesn't get talked about very often, uh, but payload, payload is huge. Uh, one of the pros here, uh, less energy, of course, that goes into the um, uh, hybrid application for the fuel savings. This is where Detmar is using it in their diesel fleet. Uh, this is where Wegmans is using it in their diesel fleet. Um, if you're uh, lowering the uh, burden to the fuel bill every single year, you're winning the battle. Uh, and that is key when we're talking about the whole initiative that we're talking about here. If you're investing in the green initiative going forward, the whole idea here is to be less reliant upon, not completely shut down an industry, but to be less reliant upon fossil fuels, okay? That is the whole intent here. Fossil fuels, if you're only tethered to the fossil fuel and the diesel market, you're subject to the price, the price of flux. So when diesel prices are high and you don't have any other options, to go to an alternative type of application because you're coupled to the market of diesel fluctuating from low to high, that's problematic. And if you can use less energy, less diesel, uh, you, can, you can really diversify uh, your uh, fueling portfolio amongst your fleets and really strategically apply those fuels that work in those specific applications. So uh, reducing the fuel consumption for these fleets is huge. Um, for some, more than other, okay? For some, maybe not so much at all, but I guarantee you that fuel is one of the dominant factors and attributes when these companies are sitting down with Hylion and hearing their elevator pitch on how this solution can uh, um, contribute to the bottom line savings. When we're talking about reducing the amount of energy consumption within these fleets, that's huge. The next uh, positive and pro for Hylion is there's no charging time. And I, I, I explained this to one of my colleagues this week about the Hylion opportunity really does require you to just rethink, just rethink how we propel a truck uh, down the road. Um, Tesla's done this with cars. It, it, is, it has transitioned how we've thought about how we can move a person from point A to point B using BEV technology, right? You have to think about long haul trucking in the same light. Are we so locked in our ways that we cannot incur a paradigm shift in the industry in that our idea 
of the internal combustion engine, providing that mechanical torque to the drivetrain, to the drive motor, to the rear axle, that that is the only way to propel uh, a, a truck from point A to point B to deliver goods. I, I think it takes a little bit of retooling to think about you're still going to have an engine under the hood, but that engine, it has a different function. It has, it has a multi-function. It is a power generating function for the APU uh, to charge the batteries rather than direct drive the rear axle, right? Um, to charge the onboard uh, uh, diagnostic systems, okay? That won't change, okay? Running off of an internal combustion uh, system uh, and, and a battery that's underneath of the hood to charge those auxiliary systems. Instead, it's just a rethinking of, uh, of how we look at bringing our charging mechanism with us. And the fueling that we bring does not drive the, 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 the unit down the road uh, directly, rather indirectly. The fuel is what charges the generator. The generator is what charges the battery. The battery is what puts that direct charge to the drive motor. And the drive motor is what turns the rear axle. And in some cases, I think now with the new application, both rear axles with the hyper truck ERX um, numbers thrown around of over 650 horsepower plus, maybe even more. Those specifications, I believe, are hush hush right now. And I think it's a lot of the reason why I have a premonition to believe that Hylion is working on some badass stuff, some badass stuff. And we've been provided some insights. I don't want to call them leaks. I don't. Uh, but we've been provided some insights to show that, holy smoly, man, the, 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 the torque and the power that's able to be generated, not by nature of the driver standing on the side of the road, twiddling thumbs while the batteries are charging, uh, rather to bring that fuel with them, CNG, RNG, uh, hydrogen fuel cell with them. Uh, and that allows for that uh, extended range to be realized. But the ability to uh, down uh, down play or eliminate charging time outside of just what it would typically take to charge the unit or fuel the unit, excuse me, with either CNG, RNG uh, equivalent to those diesel fueling at uh, times. Anything above that is a cost incurred to the bottom line for these large fleets. And I just don't, I don't see how they can sell it. I just don't see how they can sell it. Hylion is a solution that allows the trucking fleets to maintain all of their habits and improve upon those areas that they need to be improved on. No more, no less. There's no fat. It's a very lean business model that we've talked about. It allows the high, uh, um, uh, fleets to maintain the everything that they've ever uh, become accustomed to uh, in their application and just applies that oomph where they need it. Super important. Fueling, uh, reapply the application on having a generator under the hood rather, in, uh, rather than the internal combustion engine that drives that drive axle right directly. It just allows us to rethink how it is that we can get extended range out of these units without incurring uh, the, the downside of the BEV application, okay? The driver experience, uh, we've mentioned this a few times, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Few positive nuggets here. And it just collectively, would you look at Hylion and say, you're gonna invest in the company specifically based on driver experience? Eh, I don't know. I don't wanna offend those drivers out there. I don't drive a truck for a living. I would offend some people if I said it was an easy job. Yeah, I, I've got a lot of drivers in my community, man. And they provide a huge, huge level of insight to this whole thing. Who am I? I don't drive truck, right? I don't have an on uh, a, a, an onboard type of, uh, of perspective on this issue like Dexter does. That's why I love the content so much is because it provides that invaluable insight to the driver experience. And Dexter seems like to me to be a real honest guy. He doesn't seem to sit across from people and, 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 and offer his opinion on his real driver experience. He's explained why he doesn't burn the tires. He's explained why fuel savings and economy is, is, is so important to the bottom line. He explains that a truck is a tool. It's not getting in your Tesla and, and racing a Ferrari on the, on the road because you, can, you know you can beat that Ferrari. It's not about that. 
It's not. It's about how efficient and economical you can get from point A to point B to deliver the load. That's what it's about. And so for, for the driver experience, I do acknowledge that it is a super important element to this. I defer to the independent investor channel community of drivers that do frequent this information because it does directly impact um, what could uh, potentially either improve upon the driver experience going forward. If this thing does get incorporated, we're gonna have some drivers out there that are ex gonna experience the driver experience like they've never experienced before. And so their opinions are justified and they are warranted. And I'm just summarizing what it is that I've got on the granular level with regard to the driver experience that's been turned back. It's been positive. It's been positive. Do you invest in the stock because of that exclusively? Nah, nah, come on. You know, but it is part of the deal. We're not going to autonomous yet. There is always going to be a need for a driver and there's a hunger for drivers right now. Wouldn't it be great to sell the driver in that, you know, the experience is going to be that much more enjoyable rather than the rigors of, 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 of driving a truck and, and the real active application that's necessary, you know, shifting through gears, you know, trying to drive in this. I can only imagine how difficult that is, you know? Um, so the driver experience is huge. I put it in the pro category because I have not heard drivers come back and provide negative feedback. As a matter of fact, it's been to the contrary. That's just the facts, the way I see them, okay? Um, I will absolutely take that information if it comes in, if it's negative and drivers are saying, this is horrible. It's absolutely terrible. You know, I, I, I can't feel when the hybrid system is running. Dexter said he could feel the difference when it stopped working. That's huge to me. I pick up on stuff like that. That's huge when we're talking about quantifying the driver experience as it relates to how these solutions are being potentially accepted in the marketplace. You don't think that's going to play a factor in it? Oof, you're, 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 you're sorely mistaken. Sorely mistaken. All right. Um, the, the performance, I've mentioned it a few times with regard to the payload, uh, but the performance it is something that I do put into the pro category with a caveat. Uh, if they cannot get a thousand plus miles out of the Hypertruck ERX, um, that's going to be huge. Um, that's going to be a real, real negative uh, headwind for the company. If, 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 if by nature of the degradation of the batteries over time that you can get a thousand miles on the onset, but then over time it degrades to where you can only get 650 miles on the ERX, um, that's going to that's going to really be negative for the company because their bread and butter right now is boasting their performance. If they can get twenty percent fuel savings, uh, to Dexter's point, right, different rigors uh, require a different demand on the fuel consumption. But if the EX does support higher payloads, right, through the addition of the extra horsepower on the CNG side, it's easy to infer that there is a bottom line performance benefit, okay? I, anybody that's done their due diligence on this company is with me on this, okay? Now the Hypertruck ERX is yet to be put into the rigors. There's gonna be some fleet uh, demos put out. Those rigors uh, will be put to the test amongst the Innovation Council, uh, as well as uh, Green Path Logistics. Those are gonna be great. And if it's, it's gonna be a pro, I give them credit for this because Boy, oh boy, the caveat is, man, if they are wrong on these performance metrics, it is going to be catastrophically bad for this company in that, yeah, it's a great bolt-on unit, but the most fuel savings that we can expect is 6%. It takes 11 years to pay back the unit with a few cents every month to the bottom line. It's not worth it. You might as well just continue to run the unit without the EX because that performance, as declared, is just not there. Um, right there, that is a hybrid scenario that I put on the side, and I do give highly on credit, but man, they better be right on these specs, and there's a lot in the bearish community that are saying, show me, show me the specs, where is it that th these Northwest uh, companies were able to realize that extra horsepower, show me that they were able in their diesel applications to show the fuel savings on the fuel side, we, we need some bottom line substantiation, and these are some of the things that I feel like when in my uh, con category, my negative, that why they're being too quiet right now, these are some of the, the, the validations that they could be doing right now, and sharing that information, and creating that interest, and creating that churn in the company, Again, they're choosing to go silent on the line. I think it's a mistake. 
Uh, but that's what they're choosing to do. They better have a damn good reason as to why they're doing it. Next on the list is the flex and application here. There's a lot of people that are talking, Bev is the way, Bev is the way, Pepsi orders 100. I think that was a mistake. I think Pepsi made a big mistake on this. They're going to incur so much downtime. And I think maybe for a company that is as big a blue chip as Pepsi to just take on the name of Bev, maybe doing it for more of the social governance reason and less about the bottom line application. In other words, Pep Pepsi might have acknowledged, look, yeah, we're going to have drivers stand on, uh, on the side of the road charging their Tesla truck with their hand up their ass, uh, but we're willing to accept that. I, I would hate to say that a Pepsi that does as much due diligence as they do didn't identify that as a con with entering into a fleet contract with Tesla, but they did it anyway because they had the pros and cons list and the pros of being able to fly the social governance flag was there enough to justify and perhaps maybe offset the fact that they were paying that driver $150,000 a year to, to, again, stand on the side of the road with his head up as the ass when they're charging uh, the, the, the trucks that can go 350 miles, right? Uh, you know, the, the, how much downtime are you going to incur every single day, every single day, 45 minutes to an hour of charging? Uh, you guys that are Tesla bulls, please prove me wrong. Please tell me, Ryan, you're wrong. It takes 15 minutes. Uh, I'll disagree with you all day because it, they are going to incur downtime. And this is the Tesla. It's, it's Tesla. You, you just have to blindly follow because it's Tesla because the stock is at $1,000. No, <laughs> you, you know, you, you're right in the short term to call me wrong if the stock price is what you're using as your metric to evaluate a company. Okay. You're right. I'll tip my hat to you. No problem. Okay. Doesn't make your genitalia bigger. It just means that in the short term, you're right when comparing a $4 stock price to a $1,000 stock price. Real world application, I question the motives of Pepsi in doing what they do. And I actually challenge the notion that they made the right decision. I absolutely do. All right. But the flex and application is such that a Hylian can enjoy a full electric application where required in the city application for the long extended ranges, bringing the ability to charge on the way makes sense. The ability to move from a CNG, RNG application to a fuel agnostic application, I think this is 10 years plus down the line. I, I don't give as much credit to Nikola in saying that uh, hydrogen fuel stations are here now. They're not, they're not here. They're not, they're, they, they are in uh, like Oompa Loompa land, um, but they're not here in reality, okay? Um, the Oompa Loompas, uh, great, that's wonderful. You can have yourself convinced that they are here now. I'm here to tell you that for the majority of my life, I spend a lot of my time with both of my feet planted in reality, okay? And they're just not here yet. Do I want them to be here tomorrow? I do. I think it's better for the planet. I think it's better for transportation industry as a whole. However, I think that we need to really understand the realistic build out of the infrastructure on the hydrogen fuel cell. Hylion can boast transitioning from uh, strictly CNG, RNG to a fuel agnostic type of a, an application uh, to uh, hydrogen fuel cell at some point down the line. But I think the real key takeaway here when we're talking about the pro is the uh, flex in their application. In other words, different applications can be strategic, strategically applied uh, from a best fit perspective. Uh, and I think the fleets will really, really come to appreciate that it's not a one size fits all. It's a, hey, what is it that you need first? And do we have the solution to meet that need? That's an absolute game changer when we're talking highly on, okay? The bulls understand this, okay? Um, the data, the data I think is a real pro. Um, this has been a pro for me from the beginning. It's not something that is talked about very often. I think the onboard monitoring, the cloud computing, the algorithmic data, driver tendencies, terrain that the, that the truck is being put into, uh, the forecast and anticipation of preventative maintenance going forward, I think is huge. I think it's huge. Companies are always interested in quality management systems uh, to put into place to further along the efficiencies of their business and to be able to predictably um, forecast when certain maintenance pieces, certain uh, efficiencies are starting to degrade over time. This is the part of Hylion that gets missed all the time. Uh, you suck, Ryan. You should just invest in Tesla. Get out of my face with that. I'll invest how I want. Hylion has got this dialed in. It, will it be improved upon over time? Yes. Is there a need in the industry for this data extrapolation 
hundred percent. Could you absolutely dive into the specific driver tendencies for a specific route and put drivers strategically on those, those routes, number one, that they prefer, but number two, where it's maybe a best fit rather than just, hey, go drive the route with your tendencies. There, there's, there's no um, harmonization of your tendency with the fuel consumption that you're able to realize on terrain A as opposed to terrain B. I think it's fascinating. And this is something that Sultan Zarek, the CEO of Agility pointed out, excuse me, retract that. It was actually the CEO of Dana Logistics that said that this is really the bullish conviction behind Hylion and really one of those kind of unforeseen values in realizing the data extrapolation that is made available. And this is where the technology label comes when we talk about Hylion and what they could bring in advancing uh, the, the technology application within the trucking fleet, huge, huge pro as far as I'm concerned. TCO, we all know, TCO, uh, total cost of ownership to the bottom line. When Hylion goes out there, talks about the products with the fleets uh, and realizing that TCO for many of the examples that I've talked about in this video, you can kind of understand. When I sit down, I would love to have the ability to sit down with Coke, honestly, and just be like, because I don't talk to Coca-Cola as if they're a superstar. I just look at them as, look, if everything is going perfect, Coca-Cola, then you don't need me here. But what are your needs? And I wait. This is how I sell stuff, honestly. You know, sell me this pen. What is it that you need? Okay. I need this pen because it has sentimental value to me. And I've tested hundreds and hundreds of pens in the industry. This one, Nobody signs a document in blue ink like this pen right here. So you sit down with Coke and you say, what is it that you need? Okay. Well, we need to make sure that we don't sacrifice bottom line efficiency to the company. We are a publicly traded company uh, and a dividend king at that. Okay. We have a, an obligation to our shareholders to, up, up to, um, uh, to, to continue to acknowledge how important that moat is. Um, in, in the marketplace to protect for our dividend holders, okay? A lot of our strategic uh, drive is driven around how can we take the existing business in understanding the moat of a Coca-Cola. In other words, i.e. people are not gonna stop drinking Coke, okay? If I went to a McDonald's and I stopped seeing Coca-Cola in the vending machine, it would appear weird to me. It would be as if I go to a Red Robin and look at the table and there's a generic brand of ketchup on the table as opposed to what? Heinz ketchup, right? That's moat. That's the power of a moat, okay? But when I sit down with Coke and I'm like, what, what, what do you guys need? The bottom line, TCO, boom, we can benefit. Here it is. What are we looking at for fleet uh, uh, revolution here? What are your new introductions? Do you even want to go green, okay? Do you have an interest in going green? And what are your concerns with going green? Well, we don't want to sacrifice on efficiency. Absolutely, of course you don't. Um, do I have a product or do I not? to improve upon those efficiencies and speak to the total cost of ownership over time, okay? Are you willing to make an, a, a, a higher uh, initial uh, investment in your units to realize that total cost of ownership on the back end? Because if you take a diesel comparison on the onset and a highly on Hypertruck ERX, the ERX is more expensive. You're gonna have to pay for that technology up front. The idea is that those projections run out seven to 10 years and that that unit over time cost significantly less than the diesel. Because over the top cost of running that unit, you've got to fill this one with diesel. This one, you put RNG, right? So th those bottom line efficiencies and selling doesn't have to be difficult. Th that whole thing about me talking about the 200 pens that I've tested, that's true. I, I wasn't selling you on anything. I was just merely suggesting that this is the best pin because I truly believe that it is the best pin that I've, and it is. These are the best pins that you can ever use. They're fantastic. They, they, they're, they're fluid, they're beautiful. They make a fabulous mark on the paper. It's just, they're wonderful. I use them at work. I sign my documents in blue ink, I'm military. They're fabulous, best pin out there. You have to believe what it is that you're talking about. You have to believe, hi Leon, that you can sit across from anybody and the, these training techniques need to be codified with regard to their quality management systems. And I believe that they have the sales team in that have gone through these rigors before. It's not rocket science. It's understanding your customer needs and delivering on those needs. It's not hard. It's easy. Piece of cake. Go sit down. Sell it. Sell it. You're all good. 
All right, go sell it. And then go looking for dinner. <laughs> it's the program. It's one of my favorite movies. Anyway, TCO, it's definitely a pro when we're talking highly on. Um, to reduce greenhouse gases, I, I think this is one of the noble um, applications and people talk, you know, okay, and they pick fun. You know, it's like, you're losing your ass, Ryan, which it just isn't true. Um, I have money. As bad as things are right now, uh, I could go to South Africa. I could go to North Africa. I could go to Egypt. I could go anywhere in Europe, anywhere in the world. And I would be the same person. I'd be happy. I'm a happy man. Doesn't matter. Okay. I'm aggressive on this topic because I think this is something that deserves attention. And I think this whole blase attitude of, you know, uh, entering into now it was it was a priority when it was used as a political tool to take over office. And I'm a political in my application. I, I believe just as many Democratic agenda items as I do Republican. I really do. Um, and I think overall, I think the government is fraught with, with waste. Um, but I find it interesting how people buy into this whole, the world is ending in 10 years, uh, because it speaks to the sense of urgency that we need to have with protecting our planet, which I do agree with. But then when the office is taken, all of a sudden now, I'm in. It's what's perceived to be by me a blasé type of approach to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Can we do it? <laughs> Hylion seems to speak to a technology that does just that, to take methane off of the landfills and our farms that is easily collectible, run through a pipeline and delivered through existing infrastructure now. Um, if you want to tell me that the technology doesn't exist, me and you will have at it because that is just not true. The, the very fact that Hylion cannot deliver its solution to the marketplace is by nature of a lot of catalysts that have not put, put out in there, and especially incentives through catalyst, right? By our federal government, for example, to where if I sit down with a Coca-Cola and say, Ryan, you're pretty passionate about your blue pen, but we just still identify that there is a risk with new technology. That is something that I cannot counter. I can't, unless I say, okay, I understand you are taking an initial onset cost to take on the Hypertruck DRX, but something that the federal government in acknowledgement of how important this is at this particular juncture in time for you and every other blue chip company out there that ships goods across this United States is that the time is now and to allow for that bridge to gap between your concerns of entering into new technology uh, from the old is to provide you some sort of an, an, an incentive credit uh, to do that, 125000 that's yours to the bottom line. To put this into the fleets and start to scale up, if it absolutely ends up tits up for you and it ends up to be a complete waste of time and energy and no benefit to the TCO, then that $125,000 is a pledge to acknowledging the specific risk that you're taking on the onset. Chances of that happening are very, very low. What's going to happen is you're going to use that credit you're going to put this into your fleet and you're going to find that it provides you bottom line efficiencies that you could have never, ever anticipated. You don't need a diesel mechanic anymore, do you? All right. A lot of the plug and play maintenance on these uh, hyper truck ERXs are just pulling the old battery packs and installing with the new. It's that simple. That was a benefit up front that you couldn't have foresaw because you were stuck in that mindset of understanding what the total cost of ownership was in the diesel application, the mechanical maintenance side of the house that goes into maintaining that diesel dominated fleet, as opposed to doing away with some of those necessities and putting this uh, uh, electrified powertrain uh, into play and how it could have some trickle down effects downstream of your operations when it comes to the maintenance that's required to uphold those systems and make sure that your Coca-Cola can go from point A to point B. That's how it's done. That's how it's done. CNG, RNG, HFC, I've already talked about this, hydrogen fuel cell, RNG, CNG, being the multi-dimensional application here, they can realize all of them minus the hydrogen fuel cell because the infrastructure is just not there. So the multifaceted application, here's the pro, I've already talked about this a little bit. And as we close down this video, I don't know if I ended up talking for two hours. I don't know, guys, I, I get in my zone. If it bothers you with the extended uh, videos, um, I feel like people, when they address my highly on videos and they say, um, you know, Paul said he, he does longer videos, I can't help myself. I'm going to talk until I've proven my point. 
Some people have call, called me long-winded, no problem. They've even taken enough of their time to put long-winded into the comments. That I find interesting enough. If you don't like the content, leave. <laughs> I, I do this for the benefit of the cause. I don't do this for the benefit of the independent investor channel. I do this for the benefit of the cause. And I know that there's people out there that potentially own this stock. Maybe they got into it early. Maybe they got into it inter inadvertently. Maybe they got into it and they're second guessing the investments that they've taken in this company. And maybe they get a little bit of fulfillment from this. I cannot deliver that level of fulfillment and holistic rationalization that I provide in 10 minutes. I can't do it, so I won't. I can't, so I won't. The last three things I will mention is this. The amount of insider buying on Hylion is increasing. Uh, executives are buying the stock right now. Um, haven't in a couple of weeks, but in December, there was some strategic buying going on internally to the company. If you haven't noticed, as of late entering into January, the volume of the company has gone up and it's helped put a little bit of a base. It's dipped into the threes a couple of times here. Uh, only to increase back. We're back above four here. Is this the start of something with regard to a turn? I don't know. I won't call that. I refuse to call it. I certainly won't call it and disclose that to you guys. Um, my $24 price target is absolutely real. Um, that's where I think the company should be valued with the progress that's been made thus far. With the strength of the balance sheet and everything that I've talked about here, the stock should be at $24. Okay, it should be. Had they done a few additional things different, maybe it could have been. Maybe there could have been a little bit more oomph put to some of those areas that I feel that like they've been a little bit soft on sales, right? Uh, does the supply chain affect the stock price? Sure, sure. You could argue that it does, but volume every single day has started to pull that uh, average volume per day from about 2.8 shares uh, up to about two, uh, three, and in some cases, 4 million shares traded hands. And I don't know if those are sellers or buyers um, doing the push pull on the stock right now, but that volume is increasing to three to four million uh, on an average every single day. I've noticed the average volume has increased. The last thing I will mention here, and I foot stomped this on my last Ilion video, and I will end with this institutional ownership is increasing, not decreasing. Institutional ownership is increasing in this company. And I can guarantee you, um, I, through my due diligence, um, I'm not a stock analyst, I don't care to be. Um, I don't put a lot of uh, credence in that. Uh, I think people like myself, I think people like Paul, who do a great job. Um, Paul's got a lot of experience, um, which at 43, I've got some. I don't have uh, the, the life experience that Paul has. I think he's in his 50s. He's still a young guy too, but he's got a lot of experience in business, stock. You just tell, listen to the guy, listen to the guy. You know, instead of making an observation that he rants, I think that's pretty shallow. I do. I think it's disrespectful and I think it's shallow and I, I, don't, I don't get that at all. Um, people can say I rant, no problem. Um, I'm at a, I've been able to render results through my ranting. Um, how's your application? Does it work? Yeah, you still live in paycheck to paycheck? Do you spend too much? Do you only sit back to criticize because you wish that you could have a successful mindset? Why don't you try listening instead of talking more? Right? If that gets under your skin, it should. Because if you're that very person that's like, damn, okay, I didn't come into this message to hear a lesson from somebody who's, you know, doesn't have any money. No problem. I have money. I've earned it on a blue collar salary. My level of success is the level of the separation that I was predestined to realize. And through my own sheer free will and successful mindset application has separated from that predestined path to the path that I'm on now. And that is the path to riches with no silver spoon up my ass and one that I've been given nothing on, zero. I've earned it all. This will be no different, okay? The last thing I will mention here is stay positive. Uh, we are in a dark period with regard to the overhang in the stock, okay? I totally understand that. Um, be positive. Uh, I mentioned the call out of those other channels at the top of this live stream. I do that to be positive, okay? I don't call out other channel creators when it comes to topics like this. Um, if you go back and look through my catalog of history, I don't do that. Um, there are channels right now that are being predicated and built upon uh, the very nature of calling somebody out um, on, on, their, on their application. 
the fallacy in that is that you end up consuming your own life with pointing fingers at others. And I think it, the, the real uh, stress test in this life is to be able to look in the mirror and understanding what you can do to be a better applicator. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure and subscribe to the channel. Leave your comments at the bottom of the video. We will be coming out these every week. I think it's prudent. Um, I think in the short to medium term, I think it's futile. Uh, but I think we do need to foot stomp and continue to generate churn on this topic. I think it's super important. And I know there's uh, investors out there and, and listeners and uh, interested truck drivers as well that are interested in this topic. I'm glad to deliver on those fronts and, and just only hope in the bottom of my heart that you appreciate the message too. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the message and good luck in your investment future. Mm -hmm.